Good morning. Welcome. We gather in person and online to worship on this fifth Sunday of Lent. Our musicians today are our bluegrass group, and we look forward to hearing more of their beautiful music. We have Colleen, Karen, Janice, Eric, Beth, Lori, Stu, and Michelle. Our assisting minister is Pete. Our AV tech on site is Peter. Our preaching minister is Pastor Roger, and I'm your presiding minister. Please stand as you are able now for our confession and forgiveness. Oh, 
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Merciful God, we cry to you, we cry to you, deep in our souls, there's a longing for you, we cry to you, we cry to you. The prayer of the day. Let us pray. O oh Lord God, merciful, merciful judge, judge, you are he, inostable fountain of forgiveness. Replace, Replace our hearts of stones with hearts that love and adore you, that we may delight in doing your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated for the reading of the scriptures. In the first reading, after Jacob's death, the brothers of Joseph begged for forgiveness for the crime they had done against him. You intended to do me harm, Joseph said, but God used this as an opportunity to do good and save many lives. This reading is taken from Genesis 50, verses 15 to 21. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, what if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong we did to him? So they approached Joseph saying, your father gave us this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now therefore, Please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good, in order to preserve a numerous people. As he is doing today, so have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. In the second reading, we find that the Christian community has significant struggles with diversity. Here Paul helps us understand that despite different practices in worship and personal piety, we do not judge one another. All Christians belong to the Lord Jesus Christ who died for all of us and will judge each of us. This reading is from Romans 14 verses one through 12. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat. For God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? 
It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall, and they will be held, and for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let us be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. And those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord. Since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain, abstain in the honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. While, why do you pass judgment on your brothers or your sister? Or you, why you do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us will be accountable to God. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Please stand as you're able for the Lenten verse. Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 18th chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. And Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all of his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me, and I will pay you but he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he could pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, 
his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my Heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. This week, as we continue our Essential Jesus study and readings, we are going to look at some of the hard sayings of Jesus. Some of them are hard to understand, such as when Jesus says in our first reading this week, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. The first followers responded to that. This teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? Early listeners accused Christians because of this verse and the action of Holy Communion of practicing cannibalism. Before we get grossed out, we realize that Jesus wasn't talking about physically eating his, us physically eating his flesh and blood, but about the spiritual connection that we have as his followers, how we become a part of him and he becomes a part of us. In fact, even though some expressions are difficult for us to understand, that wasn't the case for all the references. Perhaps some of the best guidance that we can receive as we read these difficult things that God has said is to, just, is to consider that God loves us. That is why God sent his son, because of that love. And he gave us these words as a testimony of God's love and to bring us closer to God and not further away. When trying to understand difficult passages of Jesus, I take Mark Twain's advice to heart. It's not the parts of the Bible that I can't understand that bother me. It's the parts that I do understand. Well, today we're going to look at a difficult passage of a part that we do understand. That does bother us. I want to tell you a story from my past and how one woman I was privileged to serve as her pastor showed me and our entire congregation how to do a very hard thing. It also united me and our congregation that I was serving in a much deeper way than we had ever been united before. It was a beautiful fall day. The majestic maple trees that framed the church and dipped into the creek that gently babbled behind it were turning shades of red and gold. The congregation located in a small valley on a road between the growing suburb and the Dayton Mall provided a quiet oasis of peace and tranquility to all who came by. It had served this role well for centuries. Its cemetery across the road was the final resting place of soldiers from the Revolutionary War. In the mid-1800s, The basement under the sanctuary is rumored to have harbored runaway slaves after they had crossed the Ohio River 40 miles to the south. So on that beautiful fall day, the congregation rejoiced when John came to worship. He was in his mid-twenties. He had been gone for a few years after a stint in the Coast Guard. He lived just a stone's throw from his parents in an old farmhouse just up the hill from the church. Many members approached him with hugs and handshakes. They knew him well. Marilyn and Clarence were lifelong members and had John and his older sister, Anita, baptized there. 
He had participated in Sunday school, youth lock-ins, VBS. As a young boy, he had muddied and soaked his clothes in the creek after services, searching for minnows and crawdads in the shallows of the creek. As part of the youth group, he had enjoyed potlucks in the fellowship hall and participated in the annual chicken dinners and helped clean up and bus tables afterwards earning donations to go to one of the three youth camps in Ohio, which were also called Crossways Camps, whose director, you might be surprised to know, was Steve Lee, a former member of this congregation before he had moved back here and did similar work. Everyone knew and loved John. So it was with great joy when he came back to worship. Later that afternoon, <clears throat> my home phone rang. It was another member. She was breathless and was crying so hard that I could barely make out what she was saying. Something about a shooting. Clarence was dead. John had turned himself in at a local police station, and Marilyn was out of town visiting her daughter. This fellow prisoner thought that she'd be back later that afternoon. Could I be at her home when she came home to deliver the terrible news? I raced over to her home and waited for her to arrive. The afternoon hours dragged on, the sun descended slowly in the sky, illuminating the once vibrant glowing trees and darkening shadows. Their leaves came down listlessly now. This day that had started with such joy and ending now with such sorrow and tears. Finally, Marilyn's car pulled into the driveway. She immediately knew as I greeted her and asked her to go inside that there was bad news to be delivered. As she sat down, I looked at her and told her the terrible news. Her son had killed her husband. The news brought shock, tears, questions with no answers, deep sadness, numbness, prayers, and silence. We sat in silence for a long time. The gloom of the gathering evening matched our moods. Then after a very long time, Marilyn stood up, walked to her phone, and said words I will never forget. I have to make two phone calls, one to bury my husband, and the other to defend my son. And that is exactly what she did. She became a leading advocate in Southwest Ohio for NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, and also in our own congregation. She modeled for us what it meant to forgive she refused to let anyone blame John for his father's death. That is something she did faithfully until her death only a few short months ago. Through it all, she remained positive and loving and a model of grace, wisdom, and acceptance for others. She regularly visited her son in the Miami Valley Mental Hospital regularly conferring with her lawyer to make sure that her son received the best treatment. She would check in with me after my communion visits to see if he needed anything that we were missing. We had Clarence's funeral and the congregation where he and Marilyn had raised John and his sister. And through it all, she taught that congregation and me the power of forgiveness and the new life that it brings. 
When I think about how our Lord suffered an unjust death, yet still forgives us, I often think of Marilyn. Marilyn knew that if she lived without forgiving her son, her husband wouldn't be the only person that would have died on that tragic fall day, that she would have died too. Maybe not all at once, maybe not in a month or in a year or two, but she would have died well before her time. We all suffer from a mental illness that we cannot escape. We want to love others. We hope to love others. And sometimes we actually do. And then when we are hurt, we forgive. We actually do. But even under the best of circumstances, when things seem so bright and golden and full of promise, it is still difficult to do. But inevitably, there are also hard days when forgiveness is tough and brutal and seems cruel and unjust and unfair. When we have done nothing wrong and the wrongdoer refuses to admit what they have done or they have long since passed away, but we are still asked to forgive. Regardless of the day and the circumstances, all of our wounds are difficult to cure if not properly dressed. We can cover them over. We can say it's going to be okay. We can say they don't really bother us when they do. But the root infection is still there, coursing into our bloodstream, waiting to fester and burst open into view for us and everyone when it's slightly bumped because that is how sin works. It's an insidious infection of our souls. If not cleansed, it will fester and grow. Jesus addresses this infection that we all suffer from by providing his life-giving blood as a cure for our sin-sick souls and models how to forgive with his own life and his own death. But it is still hard to deal with because we are always looking for loopholes, for exceptions, for justifications not to forgive, allowing us to hang on to our wrongs just a little bit longer. That is why Jesus, in teaching what it means to be part of the kingdom of God answers Peter's question on how many times should he forgive his brother and sister. Notice he says, brother or sister. He's referring to members of the faith community, but forgiveness isn't limited there because the faith community is to be an example to the broader communities that we are all a part of. And if we live like those broader communities without modeling forgiveness, if we live like the ungrateful servants who refuse to forgive a trivial debt that they are owed after they've been forgiven an insurmountable debt, then we are no better than the outside communities and there is no chance for them to change. In fact, in the verses preceding this passage, the church is to be God's instrument and demonstrator and model of God's forgiveness. Precise instructions are given to deal with another member's sin. Point out this fault when the two of you are alone. If they listen, you have regained that family member. If they fail to listen to you, take one or two others along, not for your protection, but for their protection, so that they make sure Every word that you say is confirmed. If they refuse to listen to them, then tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen to the church, then let them be considered as outsiders, no longer part of the community. This is so sacred to us that we have enshrined it in our con congregation's constitution. 
But there is a problem with this. Though we hardly, though we largely accept the principle of absolute forgiveness, we have difficulty practicing it. In fact, to tell the truth, I have never seen this work in practice. Oh, don't get me wrong. I've attempted it, and I've been part of processes to attempt it. I've been on councils and in congregations where this has been tried, but I've never seen someone follow the process to the end. Usually it ends prematurely with one side or the other just throwing up their hands and stomping off in a huff, saying that the other side is just irredeemable, not able to be forgiven. They just don't get it. And then they wash their hands of the whole affair. But just because something is difficult doesn't mean it shouldn't be done over and over and over again. Because we are broken people who are in need of a Savior to care for us in ways that we cannot. So when Peter asks how many times should he forgive a member of the church and offers his answer of seven times, perhaps knowing that breaking a vow three times was making a permanent unforgivable vow, he doubles it and then adds one, thinking that's got to be right. And Jesus says, no, not seven times, but 77 times, an infinite number, too many to keep track of. In fact, that's the point. Keep doing it over and over and over again and don't keep track. Though there may be a limit to our grace, thankfully there's no limit to God's. That gives us the ability to face another day as fully free and forgiven children of God. And when we experience that grace in our lives, we discover we are standing on holy ground and we experience the sensation and the reality of new life. So when Marilyn made that statement and then lived it out with her love by celebrating her husband's life and defending and caring for her ill son until the day she died, and not insisting on harming him anymore, then he and she had already been harmed. She reminded us of the height and the breadth and the depth of God's love. When I experienced that then, and afterwards to this day, it has seemed like a new way of living, literally, a new life given, a new kingdom breaking in on me. I sometimes wonder why did that happen there in that congregation? Was it because of that congregation's history of being in a reconciling community well before that became in vogue? One where they would rescue runaway slaves and care for people who had broken down and needed help. Or, and people knew in that part of the city that if anybody needed a place to stay or food, that they could go to that congregation and receive it. I'd like to think that that was the case. But this was also the congregation that when I began there, they were at war with one another. The pastor, was at odds with the secretary for years. In fact, it got so bad that he wouldn't even come to the church during the week because the secretary that lived there was a lifelong member had become so poisonous in their relationship. And then when I started, worship wars began can't have guitars in the sanctuary, can you, leading worship? I mean, not even banjos or dulcimers. And then other things happen. The old 1862 sanctuary that we were worshiping in, we weren't going to 
leave that sanctuary and go to another and build another, were we, for a new generation and put projection and all that newfangled stuff in? Who would want that? So in the midst of all of this tumult and turmoil, this happened. And then all of that stopped. And I think it stopped because forgiveness was born in a new way. I think that made that place very special, that they became immunized and saved by God's grace through God's forgiveness. But you know, that isn't the only time I've experienced that special feeling in a congregation. I've experienced that here too. In our constant striving and search to meet the needs of those within and beyond our walls, writing letters such as Bread for the World, quilts for those nearby and across the world, gifts to help a former staff member's family, educating ourselves on how to take care of the earth and acknowledge that this land belonged to indigenous Americans first, traveling to Jamaica and South Africa and Romania and supporting missionaries in Japan, educating ourselves on Palestinian and Israeli conflict and black racism and studying how to be more engaged in our civic responsibilities and having conversations on how to be a more inclusive and welcoming community to LBGTQIA plus persons. In fact, as we were doing those studies in January and February to be more inclusive and welcoming, I was surprised and gratified to hear the challenge from many of you who said that we weren't going far enough. Our vision was not broad enough. That there is no end to God's grace. What about the mentally ill? What about different races? What about people with different abilities and mobility issues? That this will be the beginning and not the end of grace to others. How does an environment like this happen? It happens when we realize by God's grace we are forgiven and blessed. And then living it out that God's grace expands our hearts. That's what I would encourage you to remember as you are going through the hard sayings this week. Remember that Jesus spoke these words not to confound us or make our lives harder, but to tell us how much he loved us and to place in our hands the key to bind or loose, to enslave or set free, and to invite others into God's grace that truly saves our lives and will save their lives too. Amen. Our hymn of the day, Change My Heart, O God. Please stand as you're able.
whole church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue with the prayers of the church. Trusting in God's promise to reconcile all things, let us pray for the church, the well-being of creation, and a world in need. The prayer response is, your mercy is great. God of the covenant, through the church you draw us into community. We give thanks for holy baptism and holy communion, through which we know our sin is forgiven. Help us to forgive, to give, forgive ourselves and to forgive others as we seek to love as Jesus loved us. Hear us, O God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is great. God of all that exists, you lavish the earth with extravagant beauty. Preserve the rich and complex diversity of living things. Support local, national, and international efforts to protect the environment for future generations. Help all of those who are dealing with the effects of tornadoes, flooding, and other storms. Hear us, O oh God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is great. God of the nations, you desire peace and plenty for all people. Defend those who challenge oppression and expose corruption. Support advocates for human rights, social justice, and the welfare of children. Bring peace to all places of war and violence including Haiti and Sudan, for Russia and the Ukraine, for Israel and Hamas. Bring food, water, and other needed supplies to those who are suffering. Hear us, O God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is great. God of goodwill, you restore what is broken. We pray for any experiencing estrangement, conflict, or abuse in families and intimate relationships. Protect all those who are vulnerable especially those living in institutions. Uplift those struggling with addiction, depression, and other mental health issues. Comfort all those grieving the loss of a loved one. For Rick Babbler and family, mourning the death of his brother, Gary. For Dale Wiesman and family, mourning the death of his sister, Theone. And for the pa family of Pastor Dennis Pigorsch as they mourn his death. Bring your healing to all who are sick or injured, including Dave, Wayne, Ian, Marsha, Dave, Jan, for those living with cancer and other health concerns, for those homebound and on hospice care, and for those we name now in our hearts before you. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God of every time and place, you are with us. Support ministries of prayer and presence in this congregation. Move us to reach out with love to any who are homebound, lonely, grieving, in treatment, or ill. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Accompany us on our Lenten journey, God of grace, and receive the prayers of our hearts through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. You may be seated as we receive our offering.
Please stand as you are able for the offering prayer. Let us pray together. Jesus, you are the bread of life and the host of this meal. Bless these gifts that we have gathered, that all people may know your goodness. Feed us not only with this holy food, but with hunger for justice and peace. We pray this in your name. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our, our Father, Father in heaven, heaven, hallowed be your name. Your, your kingdom, kingdom come, come, your will be done. Be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. We do communion by intinction, dipping the wafer into the wine. We also have gluten-free wafers and grape juice, so please ask your server, and if you prefer, prepackaged communion. Bread for the journey, a feast for hungry hearts. Come to the table of Jesus Christ. Thank you. 
post-communion blessing and prayer. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Generous God, at this table we have tasted your immeasurable grace. As grains of wheat we are gathered into one bread. Now make us one loaf to feed the world. In the name of Jesus, the bread of life. Amen. Amen. We continue with the children's message. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hey, guys. Hey, guys, guys, guys. Wait, what's going on? Wait, wait. No, one at a time. Guys, one at a time. Joshua, you go first. Hey, Moses, it's okay. You will get a turn. All right. Okay, what? All right. So Moses has decided to become a vegetarian, and he won't go out for burgers with you. All right. Okay, guys, guys, calm down. All right. Moses, now it's your turn. Well, right, it is your choice, and I totally get that. Wait, and now Joshua's making fun of you? Hey, Joshua, come on, get back here. Let's talk about this. We're going to settle this first, but I need you to tell me why Holly and Soccer Bear look so uncomfortable. Wait, they're standing on their heads until you two quit arguing? Oh boy. Well, thank you both very much for stopping the argument. And I think that Holly, Bear, and Soccer Bear looked much happier. So now let's look to God's word to sort this out. All right, so we're going to go back to when Paul started a church in Rome. Now there were people of many races and cultures who came together to follow Jesus. Then they started arguing over food. It got a little heated, just like it did with you two. Paul had to write a letter to get them to stop. All right, so I'm going to read something that will help you figure out this issue. All right, so in Romans 14, verses 2 through 4, it says, Some believe in eating anything, while some eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain. And those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them all. Who are you to pass judgment? It is before God that they stand or fall. Yes, very good, Joshua. Now you understand why 
it doesn't matter if Moses is a vegetarian. That's good, Moses. I'm glad that you're not going to argue about it anymore. So now let's pray. Dear God, thank you for your word. Guide us so that we always go to it to solve our problems with others. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so now I have a really good idea. Why don't we go look up recipes for veggie burgers and that way we can all eat burgers together. All right, well, that's our children's message for today. Goodbye. God bless each and every one of you until we see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you, Brigitte and friends. <laughs> a few announcements this morning. Um, we are looking for a new uh, financial administrator. The position would be 10 to 15 hours a week. Uh, Debbie, our current financial administrator, is stepping down from the position, but will be with us until we can find someone. The council has decided to hire an outside accounting firm, Lambert Business Solutions, who also works with Zion Lutheran Church. They will do work off-site, but we also want someone on-site as well. If you or someone you know is interested or could be interested, please speak to one of us pastors. A grief group will begin this Monday, the 18th, from 4.30 to 6 p.m. Nancy Showerman will be leading that group. If you're interested, please contact her before Monday afternoon. Her contact information is in your announcements. It is time to give your Thrivent Choice dollars. If you are a Thrivent policyholder, you can give your Thrivent Choice dollars to Prince of Peace. The deadline is March 31st. Our Wednesday Lenten service continues this week at 6.15. We will use our Holden Evening Prayer along with a time for laying on of hands for healing. Before the service, there's a meal at 5.15 uh, put on by our welcome group. Everyone is invited, and a free donation will be accepted. Holy Week begins next Sunday, Palm Sunday. We will have the following week a Monday Thursday service at 6.15 and a Good Friday service at 6.15 as well. There's also an ecumenical Good Friday service at noon at Zion Lutheran Church. Easter services are at 8 a.m. and 9.40 a.m. There's still time to order your Easter flowers. Easter flowers of lilies, mums, or hydrangeas. You can find our online order form on our website. If you'd like to participate in this civic life and faith study, please sign up at the Advocacy Bulletin Board by March 24th. We are looking for members to help us host our fellowship time between services. Training is available and there's a sign-up sheet on the refrigerator in the narthex. You are invited uh, to join our youth for the last Sunday of making Thai blankets in the Congregational Life Room. These blankets will be given to Pillars a Homeless Shelter. And one last announcement. We have two more Sundays to write letters to our members of Congress in support of anti-hunger legislation. So if you haven't written your letter yet or letters, please stop by the table in the narthex for materials to write letters and help us reach our goal of 125 letters from Prince of Peace. That concludes our announcements. Please stand for the final blessing. Beloved, we are God's own people, holy, washed, renewed. God bless you and keep you shower you with mercy, fill you with courage, and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Our sending song, Where Could I Go?
Prince of Peace is a family of Christians going in faith and reaching out in love. Go in peace, share your bread. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.